everyone, Ricardo here. And in this video, I'm gonna be showing you some of the basics of overcurrent protection and how to select settings for protective relays. So I'm gonna be showing you how to calculate the pickup, the time dial, and the curve type of an overcurrent element. And then we're gonna see how we can do protection coordination in a substation. All right, so let me show you the example substation that we're gonna be using. All right, so imagine, for example, that you have a substation that looks like this. And in this case, let's say that we're trying to develop the settings for the SEL 751 relay on feeder number one. So we're gonna select the settings for this relay over here. Now, what we wanna do is to protect this feeder for both overload conditions and fault, in other words, short circuit conditions, meaning that we are going to measure the current that's flowing through this feeder with our protection relay, which again, in this case, is the SEL 751. And we're gonna do that via the current transformer that we have over here, which is a 1200 to five or 240 to one current transformer. And so if the current exceeds a certain value, we're gonna trip this breaker over here, which I'm gonna call breaker F1 for feeder number one. So we're gonna trip that breaker when we detect one of these two conditions, again, an overload condition or a short circuit, meaning a fault condition. And again, we can do this using what's called an overcurrent element. Now, what I wanna show you as well is this TCC plotter that I have over here, and TCC stands for time current characteristic. So it's a typical term that's used to define the tripping characteristic of an overcurrent element. Now, in this video, we're gonna be focusing on what's called an inverse time overcurrent element, which is an overcurrent element that has a tripping characteristic that looks like the one I have here on the screen. So here you can see why this is called an inverse time overcurrent characteristic. And that is because the curve has an inverse tripping characteristic, meaning that the higher the current, the faster the trip time and vice versa. So the trip time is inversely proportional to the current that is seen by the relay. And you can see that over here because we have current on the X axis over here and we have time on the Y axis over here. And you can see that as current increases, so as current goes this way, the trip in time as defined by this characteristic goes down. And you can see that in the curves over here. So this is why we call this an inverse time overcurrent characteristic because the trip time is inversely proportional to the current. So the higher the current, the lower the trip time. And of course, vice versa, the lower the current, the longer the trip time. So it has an inverse characteristic. Now, generally speaking, we have three settings that we need to determine to define this overcurrent characteristic which are the pickup, the time dial, and the curve type of the overcurrent element. So let's talk about the pickup first. So here, going back to the substation that we're gonna be using as an example, which again is this one that I have over here. And let me actually go ahead and zoom in. So again, here, we're trying to determine the settings for this SEL751 relay on feeder number one. Now the relay is always gonna see what we call load current under normal conditions, meaning that when there's load flowing through that feeder, the relay is gonna see that current. This is what we define as load current, and we're gonna see that under normal operations, so that's not a fault condition. So even though we're measuring current, we have to know that if it's that low, if it's at that level, it's gonna be load current. And for example, in this case, we have 20 MVA of load current, meaning that we can see up to 20 MVA or its equivalent in current, we might see up to that current under normal conditions. So this gives us an important piece of information because we can know now how much current will flow through this feeder for unfolded conditions. So what we can do then is to calculate the current for 20 MVA at 13.8 kV. In other words, 20 MVA of course is a unit of power. And we know that in this case, our bus is 13.8 kV. And so what we can do is we can say, well, how much is 20 MVA of load at 13.8 kV? And that's what we can expect this feeder, feeder number one, to see under any circumstance, or in other words, under unfaulted conditions. So we can do a simple calculation, and let me actually switch to a blackboard. And so just from basic power system analysis, we know that the three-phase power, which I'm gonna call S, three-phase, is equal to the square root of the line-to-line -line voltage times the conjugate of the current. Here I'm gonna drop the conjugate just because we're only concerned about the magnitude of the current. 
not the angles. And so here I can solve then for current. I can say, well, the current is equal to the power S three phase, the three phase power divided by the square root of three times the line to line voltage. And these values in our case are 20 MVA. So 20 times 10 to the six, that is in volt amperes divided by square root of three times the nominal line to line voltage, which in this case is 13.8 kV. So 13.8 times 10 to the three volts. And so in this equation, my voltage is gonna cancel out. And if I calculate this, I get that this is equal to 837 amps. So what we need to do in this case then is we need to set the pickup of our overcurrent element some value higher than 837 amps because this feeder can see up to 837 amps under any unfaulted condition. So we wanna select our pickup to be slightly higher than that. And of course we need to apply some margin, typically a 50% margin is sufficient. So what we can do here is we can say, well, we're gonna take that number, 837 amps, multiply that times 1.5, and that's what we're gonna use for our pickup. And so that's gonna give us a margin of 50% above the maximum load current that this fitter can see. So if we go ahead and do that, then we can say, well, our pickup, which I'm gonna call I sub PU is 837 times 1.5, which gives me roughly, and I'm gonna round to a full number here. So that's 12, 56 amps. This is going to be our pickup over here. Let me actually switch colors to red. So this again is our pickup over here. Now, the other thing that we need to be mindful of is that although this setting ensures that we don't trip for load conditions, it does not mean that it's sensitive enough to pick up any fault in the feeder. So what you would do in real life is you would take that pickup and your power system model, and then you would run faults in your feeder, in this case, and make sure that that pickup is sensitive enough to pick up for faults anywhere on that feeder where you're trying to detect faults. So for example, if you had a power system model in let's say ETAP or SIME or Aspen or CAPE, one of these short circuit software, you would simulate faults in that feeder and make sure that this setting, 1256 amps, is sensitive enough to pick up for any faults in that feeder. In other words, faults, in that feeder, any type of fault anywhere on that feeder that you're trying to detect a fault for needs to be above this value. So this is where you're checking for two things. One, that your pickup is higher than the load current that's flowing through that feeder under any conditions. That way you're making sure that you're not tripping under unfaulted conditions. But you also have to make sure that it's below the minimum fault current in that feeder so that it's always detecting the fault. All right, so that's the first setting that we talked about, the pickup of the overcurrent element. Now we need to talk about the curve type and the time dial of the overcurrent element, which are gonna determine how fast this element trips for any fault in that feeder. All right, so first let's talk about the curve type. Now there are multiple curve types that are offered by different relay manufacturers, and there's also IEEE and IEC standards. Some of the most common curve types though here in the US are the SELU curves. And what I mean here by the curve type is the general shape of the curve. Some will be steeper than others, some will be flatter than others. So for example, in this plot that I have over here, and let me actually get rid of this, I have three curves here on the screen. All of them in this case are the U3, the SEL very inverse curves. Now again, what I mean by curve type is the general shape of the curve. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change this curve over here. And notice how this changes from a flatter curve, so if I select the U2, for example, which is the SEL inverse curve, that one is not as steep as, for example, the SEL U3 curve, which is the very inverse curve. So notice here how this curve over here changes. I'm gonna change that from a U2 to a U3, which is a very inverse, so it's a little bit steeper. And if I change that to a U4, actually, you can see how that's even steeper now. The U4 is the extremely inverse curve offered in SEL relays. So this is what I mean by the curve type, just the general shape of the curve. Some will be flatter, some will be steeper, and you need to select it such that you can do proper coordination and that you can protect the piece of equipment that you're trying to protect. So in other words, 
which curve we select will largely depend on what we're trying to protect and what we are coordinating with. So for example, in this case, and let me actually go back to the one line. So in this case, the SEL 751 feeder that we're developing settings for is protecting the feeder conductor. And it needs to coordinate also with the overcurrent element that in this example is implemented on the high side of a transformer. So for example, let's say that this relay here on the top, this SEL 487E relay is implemented also an overcurrent element, an inverse time overcurrent element. That would mean then that we would of course need to coordinate the overcurrent element on the feeder relay with whatever is implemented on that transformer relay because we wanna make sure that for example, if there's a fault down here on the feeder, that our feeder trips first before the transformer. So this is what we call coordination of overcurrent elements. We're coordinating, in this case, the feeder relay and the transformer relays to make sure that our feeder trips first under all conditions. So no matter what the fault current level is, we want our feeder to trip before the transformer relay. So going back over here, you can think of this as curve one, for example, is the transformer relay and curve two is the feeder relay, which in this case, if I select a SEL U4 curve for the transformer relay, you can see that they're gonna miscoordinate at this point over here. So generally you wanna select a curve type that is similar to the relays around the relay that you're developing settings for, because that's gonna make it easier to coordinate since the curves are gonna have similar curve shapes. Now in this case, we could say also that curve number three, for example, this one over here, would be something further downstream from the feeder breaker. All right, so that was the curve type. The third and last thing that we need to calculate is the time dial for our overcurrent element. And this is basically gonna shift the curve up for a higher time dial and down for a lower time dial. So if we increase the time dial, the trip time of our overcurrent element is gonna be a little bit slower. And if we decrease it, it's gonna be a little bit faster. So again, this depends on what you're trying to coordinate with and what you're trying to protect. So for example, let's say that our curve one over here has a time dial of three, like you can see here in this case, if we change the time dial of our feeder breaker, let's say to two, you can see how that moves the curve a little bit further down. Now, if we select a time dial of four, for example, that's gonna move it up and it's gonna cause a miscoordination at this point. So you wanna select the time dial for your overcurrent element such that it coordinates with both whatever is upstream from your relay and whatever is downstream from your relay. All right, so that's the three settings that we need to determine. Again, that was the pickup, the time dial, and the curve type for our overcurrent element. Now let's do an example using this example substation. So let's go ahead and move back to the one line and let me actually get rid of all of this over here. Now, let's say that for example, in our example substation that our transformer relay, this one here on the top, has a setting that is the following. It has a pickup of 5,000 amps, a curve type of U3, and it has a time dial of 3.0. Now in this case, just to make things a little bit easier, I'm gonna neglect the turns ratio on the transformer. So just think of this transformer as having a one-to-one -one turns ratio, and then we're talking about pickups in primary amps as opposed to secondary amps. Just to make things a little bit easier, just to show the coordination. So again, these are the example settings for the transformer relay, really 5,000 amps, a U3 curve, and a 3.0 time dial. So again, in this example, we're saying that the transformer has a curve type of U3, a pickup of 5,000 amps and a time dial of three. And now if we select the same curve type, a U3 curve for the feeder relay, which again is curve two in this example, the pickup would determine that that was gonna be 1256. And if we select the same time dial 3.0, we can see that we have very good coordination here for all points in this curve. Now, if we change this, for example, to seven on the feeder time dial, you can see now that we would have a miscoordination over here. So in this case, a time dial of three provides good coordination. And typically the industry standard for the margin that you wanna have in time between the two curves is usually 0 0.3 seconds. So you wanna have at least a separation of, let's say that I have a current of 10,000 amps, a fault current of 10,000 amps. So it would be over here. This relay feeder number one will trip at this point, 
So whatever that is, roughly 0.5 seconds. This really would trip at roughly four seconds. You want this separation to be at least 0.3 seconds, which we of course see that we meet that criteria in this example. All right, so that was a good example on how we can select settings for an overcurrent element. We chose how to calculate the pickup and how to determine the curve type and the time dial of our overcurrent element to make sure that we coordinate with the relays around our relay and also that we protect the piece of equipment that we're trying to protect. Now, a couple of things before you go. One is if you wanna learn more about overcurrent protection and power system protection in general, check out our online courses, link in the description below, where we go over all of this in much more detail. I'm also gonna be making this spreadsheet available for download. Check out the link in the description below to download this spreadsheet. All right, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel to see more videos about power system protection and power engineering, and we'll see you in the next one.